Good afternoon, everyone. It gives me immense pleasure to introduce our speaker, Dr. Saumya Swaminathan, who is here to deliver a talk on the lessons from the pandemic for science and public health. Dr. Saumya Swaminathan was most recently the World Health Organization's chief scientist, and before that, the deputy director general for programs there. As WHO's inaugural chief scientist, Dr. Swaminathan built the science division with a focus on research, quality assurance of norms and standards in digital health. She played a key role during the pandemic in coordinating scientific efforts at the WHO, as well as in setting up COVAX with a focus on equitable vaccine distribution to low and middle income countries. Dr. Swaminathan is a pediatrician by training and she's globally recognized for her immense research contributions on tuberculosis and HIV. She brings with her three decades of experience in clinical care and research, and has worked throughout her career to translate research to impactful programs. Do Dr. Swaminathan was Secretary to the Government of India for Health Research and Director General uh, of the ICMR from 2015 to 17, where she focused on bringing science and evidence into health policy making, building research capacity in Indian medical schools, and forging South-South partnerships in health sciences. From 2009 to 11, she also served as coordinator of the UNICEF, UNDP, World Bank, WHO Special Program for Research and Training in Tropical Diseases at Geneva. She received her academic training in India, the United Kingdom, and the United States of America, and has published more than 450 peer-reviewed publications and book chapters. She's fellow of the US National Academy of Medicine, the Academy of Medical Sciences of the UK, and the fellow of all the science academies in India. She's received several honorary doctorates, including those from EPFL Lausanne and the London School of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene. She serves on several national and global advisory bodies and committees and is an adjunct professor at Karolinska University in Sweden and Tufts University in Boston. Dr. Saumya Swaminathan is presently the chairperson of the MS Swaminathan Foundation. And over to you, ma'am. Welcome. So it's lovely to be here today and thanks so much for that nice introduction yeah it's been a while since i've been on the campus but uh, obviously been here many times and i realize how much keeps changing a lot of it um, is because of the young scientists and all the exciting science uh, that you're doing so i just had a very quick walkthrough of of tigs uh, this afternoon but certainly next day next time i'm i'm convinced i have to spend at least one day if not longer to, to get up to date on everything that's, uh, that's going on here. I've also been recently talking with CCAMP, uh, particularly around TB diagnostics and uh, what the future is uh, there. So uh, for this afternoon, it's, a, it's an informal, uh, more of sharing of reflections. I don't have a PowerPoint. And what I thought I would do is to reflect a little bit on my own experiences over the last couple of years with implications for uh, for us all, uh, both that's why I've said for science and for public health. And I think it's implications uh, for how we can do better at the global level, but also at the national uh, level, a lot of lessons that were learned during the pandemic, uh, hopefully will not be forgotten. And we talked about things today, like wastewater surveillance, which was being done for polio in the past, but nobody really knew about it or talked about it. And today we know that you know, this campus is doing the wastewater surveillance for COVID for Bangalore City, and it's been extremely helpful to the policymakers in terms of predicting uh, the, the future wave. In fact, yesterday, the, I was with the commissioner at a, at a panel discussion in the evening, commissioner of health, and he was saying, I wish some scientists could tell me, like, not when the next wave, but what kind of wave is it going to be, you know, how bad is it going to be, how much oxygen should I get ready with? That's what I need because I don't know what to prepare for when you keep saying prepare. So of course, that's what a resilient health system is about, that you can actually, um, you can respond to any kind of a threat. The pandemic was a, a, a too big a threat, I think, for or, or too big a test uh, for uh, most health systems and very few health systems in the world actually coped the ones that did were either those islands which completely shut their borders, like Australia, New Zealand, to some extent, Japan, you know, where they shut borders very early, tried to limit infections, uh, had quite strict. Uh, Australia, for example, had very strict uh, 
sort of movement restrictions from time to time whenever there was a flare up of cases. Um, so there was that set of countries or there were countries that had experienced in the past something similar that is SARS in 2003. And these are countries uh, in East Asia mainly that uh, actually learned lessons and remembered them and did extremely well. Countries like South Korea use technology uh, very effectively, but uh, and Taiwan, but other countries like Thailand, Vietnam, etc., just used basic public health, you know, just boots on the ground public health, and they also did very well. And when we say very well, I think we can say either in terms of limiting infections, but more importantly, limiting deaths. Now. Um, let me go back to the beginning of the, the pandemic when um, we just knew that there were these outbreak of uh, this pneumonia in Wuhan, which was not due to any of the known uh, pathogens. It was not flu, it was not anything known. So towards the end of December and uh, the first few days of January 2020, it was very clear that there was something serious going on. There were quite a few hospital admissions. And of course, there was some suppression of data at that point from China. So it was very hard to extract any information. WHO was trying very hard. And uh, one thing about the WHO is that it's an organization that's made up of member states. It's not a controlling body. So anything that WHO does is based on what all the member states agree at the World Health Assembly. And those are the rules and those, that's the, how the program is set. It doesn't have uh, these uh, 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 functions uh, or powers of going into countries and demanding to see things and all that. So this is why the uh, WHO acts by persuasion, by trying to collaborate and trying to advise and trying to be nice. Um, that's the only way to hope to get more information out. But anyway, it's partially successful. But the thing is that genomic sequencing, which had already the Chinese had started doing it, quite early on, again, it took a few days for them to release the data. Finally, it was leaked and then the government actually officially released it. Um, but for the first time, I think within a few weeks of something like this happening, we had identified a new virus, the SARS-CoV-2. So on January 10th or 11th, this was made public on the GISAID, uh, the first six sequences. So at that point, okay, so January 11th, we know it's a, it's a novel coronavirus. Then, of course, the PCR, uh, uh, the, the method, the SOP for that was developed very quickly within 24 to 48 hours, and that was published so that labs around the world could start doing the PCR. So actually, these are all because of advances in science and technology. It was possible to do it at that speed. So by Jan 15th, you know, everybody has access to the PCR protocol and the primers and everything. And uh, countries which could not have access to primers, we were also, you know, helping to supply. One of the challenges was that the whole of Africa had just two or three labs that could actually do this uh, sequencing. And so how do you roll out, you know, diagnostic tests? So the next four weeks were spent bringing, selecting a bunch of labs and bringing them, training them and bringing them up to speed so that by March, there were at least, I think, about 15 or 20 labs on the African continent that, uh, were doing PCR. But then later on, what we observed was that it was the Southern African labs, particularly South Africa, but also the other countries that did the most valuable and strategic sequencing. Other countries might have done much higher volumes of sequencing, but two of the uh, four variants that we talk about today, the beta and the Omicron, were identified and described in uh, you know, Tulio Oliveira's lab in, uh, in Cape Town. Um, and the way that they did it for Omicron was particularly impressive because within a couple of weeks or not even weeks, a few days of a doctor observing uh, a cluster of cases, which she thought was a bit unusual from the usual, what we had seen prior to that, uh, because people were coming with a respiratory illness. These were young people living in college hostels. And she felt that the, this was uh, COVID uh, behaving a little bit differently. And, and so these guys went in there and they very uh, strategically sequenced these, this new cluster uh, of cases and found that it had all of these mutations, which then were later 
described as the Omicron uh, variant. Uh, of course, WHO had the committee, you know, that used to uh, look at every new um, potential variant and, and classify it as uh, either a variant of interest or a variant of concern or a variant under observation. So um, it's uh, to say that, uh, you know, the high income countries had the capacity to do a lot of sequencing. And yes, early on, I think they made a lot of important observations uh, because when you use sequencing um, and look at the movement of people across borders, for example, or uh, across geographies within the country, you can start to understand quite a lot about where that particular infection might have originated, how many generations, you know, it's, of course, high, very high mutation rate this virus has, and, and, and also the spread, and then you can potentially start then predicting the, uh, how this could subsequently happen. Of course, we've seen that every new variant has had uh, slightly different properties or quite markedly different properties. And so that the question really is next variant, uh, we know will have some mutations which make them more transmissible because the only way the virus can survive is to keep improving its transmissibility so that it continues to spread to humans. And this is why we saw now the XBB 1.16 cause this mini wave uh, in India as well as in other countries, but the mutations that make it able to overcome uh, the antibodies and the cell mediated immune responses that we, we have today, those will be the most dangerous ones because they, uh, if they can completely overcome the immune responses we have, then they can start uh, producing severe disease again. So I think that is the if here. And people don't think it's very, very likely that this can happen, but it could. And that's why you need to continue with sequencing and correlating it with, uh, with the clinical and epidemiological features as well. There's no point just doing sequencing in the lab. That's not at all what's going to give you the information you need. So uh, from very early on, what happened is that we, uh, so when we realize, okay, it's a novel coronavirus, what next? Luckily, uh, the WHO already had a mechanism called the R&D Blueprint for Epidemics. And this was created post Ebola. Because during Ebola, West Africa in 2014-15, uh, there was chaos uh, in terms of the scientific work that needed to get done. You know, so different groups were flying in from different countries and landing there. And what we call as, you know, helicopter parachute research was happening. They would come, collect blood, disappear. And you know, clinical trials were supposed to get started. There were already Ebola vaccines on the shelf in academic labs in the world, but people just couldn't get their act together to get those vaccines into trial. And so this R&D blueprint for epidemics, which I think we should have one for the country here as well, is something that um, is uh, laying out a sort of a blueprint for what are the big, path the major pathogens or pathogen groups mainly viruses, uh, but could be others as well that, uh, that uh, could cause epidemics or pandemics in humans. And what would you need for a particular pathogen? Let's say it's Nipah or Lhasa or Ebola. Uh, what do you need? You need a diagnostic, you need a therapeutic, you need a vaccine, but you also need to understand the epidemiology, the transmission and uh, the, the other determinants of how this infection actually spreads in the community and which part is often neglected. For example, for Lhasa fever, after all these years, there is no good understanding. We know that rodents are the vectors, but there isn't still an understanding of how Lhasa actually spreads to humans, why it's more prevalent in some parts of West Africa and so on. So for many diseases, you know, those basic things are understanding is lacking. And so this, uh, what we decided was that we needed a, a scientific meeting to be held. So this was held on February 10th and 11th. In Geneva, it was still an in-person meeting. We had about 400 scientists. And what came out of that two-day deliberation is a roadmap, a research roadmap for SARS-CoV-2. In fact, we named the virus also on the same day, uh, on February 11th. The virus was named as SARS-CoV-2, and that happens through the International Committee of the Virus uh, Phylogenetics uh, Groups. And the disease naming happens by WHO. And there are rules for how you name diseases. You no longer can name diseases after people or after places because that's supposed to be stigmatizing. And therefore, a name has to be uh, neutral. 
Um, so COVID-19 was the name of the disease and SARS-CoV-2. So that happened uh, at the same time that this research roadmap was developed. And what that basically did was it helped to lay out all the priorities for research that were needed across all, not just development of products, but really understanding the virus because it's a new virus. And it, what it also did was it created this network of scientists. And that is what I found extremely uh, energizing and uh, surprising that scientists dropped everything that they were doing and decided that they would use whatever their expertise was on COVID and that they were willing to spend all odd hours of the day and night getting together and discussing their findings. And there was, there was absolutely no holding back of information or wanting to keep something for publication and all that. I saw that this huge change from what you observe normally when scientists find something exciting, they would first like to you know, make sure that it's published in their name. So what happened was that many, many hundreds of committees got created. These were all global committees, people participating in them by interest groups. So for example, assays, uh, standardizing you know, of, of neutralizing antibody assays, that was important uh, at the beginning because we knew vaccines would be developed. You need comparability, you know, so you need standards for, for everything. And then you need a target product profile. What, so what if somebody is trying to develop a vaccine, what should they be aiming for? You know, so there is absolutely nothing. Uh, then uh, the, the developer doesn't know whether they're on the right track. So we convened experts and we developed target product profiles for a vaccine, for a, a diagnostic outpatient, a therapeutic inpatient therapeutics, et cetera. Of course, vaccines, I think, proceeded best. They, it proceeded well. Diagnostics and therapeutics was a little bit lagging. Um, many reasons for that, but um, we, we should definitely do better next time. Particularly with, you know, we saw the proliferation of point of care diagnostics that were produced later on. Um, there could have been a bigger push to that and a better uh, strategy around how to do, go about it. But um, side by side with developing these target product profiles, which basically became the benchmarks that all regulatory agencies around the world agreed to. So I think that's also very important because otherwise you sometimes have the situation where you have different regulators applying different standards and it's very dif difficult for a developer. We knew in this case, if a vaccine was developed that you would need it around the world in a matter of days, you couldn't go regulator by regulator trying to get approval. So. That's why the benchmarks had to be agreed. And so there's a global network of regulators with the WHO, with whom we had all these discussions. And um, we, of course, were also in touch with all the vaccine developers. So we knew what Oxford was doing, what, you know. So every week, every week, there were these meetings and, uh, and updates. And uh, somebody would raise a query. So uh, for example, a company might say in one, and companies were allowed to participate in all these meetings, of course, Wherever there was uh, confidential information, they would, you know, make sure that everybody was aware of that. But the companies are the ones who actually know the nitty gritty of product development, right? So they would come and say, look, this is what we need. And if WHO were to do this, you know, like the standards, international units, for example, because every vaccine trial that was reported was using different units to measure antibodies. So to, to standardize all, it all into international units, you know, those are things which sound very boring, but they make uh, a lot of difference. And, and again, they would turn to WHO. So we then, uh, the other uh, observation we made uh, quite early on was that there was a lot of clinical trials that started happening, even from China. In fact, the first few trials which suggested that hydroxychloroquine and these other antivirals like clopinavir, ritonavir might be useful, came out of China. In fact, that was something that was quite remarkable that despite the tremendous uh, shock that the system was under the pressure, uh, those uh, doctors were uh, publishing a lot of the science uh, and especially on the clinical profile and all that. Uh, by the third week, you know, they had publications in the Lancet. We already knew by then elderly were getting more sick. You know, the doctors and nurses were more at risk. This is what the symptoms look like, clinical profile. Of course, we learned more as we went along. 
So it was very important that the scientists on the ground or the doctors actually start putting out all that information in the public domain. So that was, again, something which I really admired them for. And they started the clinical trials. Now, the clinical trial, of course, they controlled their outbreak very effectively. So the Wuhan outbreak you know, was, was all of 4,000 uh, patients. Um, and so they did not lead, uh, come up with any definitive conclusion. So we saw proliferation of trials happening, but none of them were powered to actually answer the question that needed to be answered. Is there a public health um, outcome that you can achieve by using drug X, let's say hydroxychloroquine, okay? So if you say, ah, oh, I can reduce symptoms by half a day, well, does that really matter? What matters to us, what mattered was mortality. Does a drug reduce mortality? So we decided to launch the solidarity trial that was a multi-country, multi-platform. And again, I think it's a lesson for how you can do a clinical trial in an emergency setting without moving anywhere. So everything was online, everything was digital, um, the data collection format was very simple. It was a one page because busy doctors in the ICU are not going to fill up 25 pages of clinical information. Outcomes were very clear, mortality at the end of 28 days and uh, secondary and okay, one or two secondary outcomes were there. And um, there was a centralized data, centralized randomization and centralized data management and everything was digital. Within a few days, we had a few webinars, 35 countries signed up. And I must tell you that countries got their ethics and regulatory approvals, including in India, within a few days. So in India, I think we had at least six or seven hospitals participating with one PI from uh, the National AIDS Research Institute in Pune and uh, Dr. Sheila Godbole. And she basically was the uh, rep for each country. We had one coordinator and multiple hospitals. Uh, over a thousand doctors participated in that trial. And within three months, um, 15,000 patients had been enrolled, followed, treated with four different arms. So there was hydroxychloroquine, there were a couple of other arms. Interferon was one of the arms uh, and uh, lopinavir, ritonavir. And of course there was a control arm that was not given any treatment. These were hospitalized patients. And okay, the end result was negative. None of these drugs reduced mortality, but it was important because the whole world was using hydroxychloroquine. And uh, so it's as important to show a drug does not work. Of course, it would be fantastic if you had a drug that worked in your first attempt, but as important to have the negative result. And I still remember when we went to the press conference and because the FDA had, had said that hydroxychloroquine was an essential, um, what's a, they've given it emergency use authorization for use. And of course, there was a lot of politics there, but. Anyway, the FDA also had come under this and they had declared it. So I remember at the press conference announcing the results and people said, so you're going against the FDA. And we said, well, we're going with our scientific findings and we have data to back it up. And uh, so we're happy to discuss with the FDA, but we believe that this drug does not work. And people say, oh, you're very bold and you know, you're going and, and so one good thing I think of being the chief scientist there was that I was given the space um, I was not under any pressure to, to be in any way politically uh, influenced. And so the director general was always backing me up and saying, you just stick to the science. And uh, you know, if you're confident with your data, then you, you need to say it loud and clear. Um, so I think I was talking about clinical trials and how we could imagine in a country like India, which is huge by itself and very heterogeneous, that a clinical trial, if it's run, you know, geographically representatively across the country at multiple sites, not only would it be faster in terms of recruiting cases, but you would, it would be much more generalizable and uh, uh, probably cost efficient as well. So the solidarity trial phase two uh, became a bit slower uh, because there were many competing priorities, but it was looking at a bunch of, uh, of anti-inflammatory drugs essentially. Uh, to see whether the, the lung damage could be minimized. Um, so by then, of course, by July, we also knew that uh, steroids, dexamethasone, was effective in reducing mortality in a, in a subgroup of people who were in the hospital and on oxygen. Uh, 
So while we were learning all these new things, we also had to put in place the guidelines. And as you know, developing treatment guidelines is there's a procedure behind it and a process. And it has to be, again, based on an updated systematic review. So a methodology called the uh, living systematic review was put in place where as new trials were coming, the systematic reviews were constantly being updated. And so if there was any change in the effect you know, of a particular drug, you could see it happening. And um, so in most cases, as more data came, it only confirmed the findings of the earlier studies. But sometimes if you go with very small studies to begin with, those could be misleading. And that's why it's important to repeat uh, clinical trials to confirm you know, the findings. So we had the updated uh, meta-analyses and systematic reviews, and we would then we moved that to digital as well so that there were frequent updates to treatment guidelines. Whenever there was a change or a new trial showed us something, we, you know, we put that up. So I think that moving the research into uh, the evidence and policy uh, very quickly, that also was, and then of course, the third step of that is it has to be taken up and used by doctors and countries, right? And that's where, I think uh, it can be more, uh, that, that whole process can be uh, improved, how a country can take the recent evidence as it's coming, update their own national guidelines, but not only update them, also make sure that they get enforced and followed. And one sad thing in India, of course, is that we have, of course, a very big private sector uh, and very heterogeneous public sector as well. And so you'll find that uh, the adherence to standard protocols is not what it should be, whether it's tuberculosis or whether it's you know, antibiotics for infections. Uh, and this is why today we see antimicrobial resistance really having gone up significantly pre-pandemic to post-pandemic because of the widespread misuse of antibiotics. And India was the only country that had this black fungus problem. We did not see it anywhere else in the world. And it was because of a misuse and overuse of, of uh, steroids, people giving higher dose or longer, or people probably self medicating themselves, people were very desperate. There was also a lot of uh, drama around other drugs like remdesivir, where the WHO, we were saying that it's marginal benefit. And yet we know people spent, you know, their life savings to buy a vial of remdesivir here for their loved ones. So, and ivermectin was the other one where there's a whole strange lobby that lobbies for ivermectin for some reason, uh, when it's many, many trials showed absolutely no efficacy for either prevention or treatment. So despite having evidence, if it's not used, then it's uh, sad, it's painful, and it's uh, wasted resources. So I think we have to look at that as well. But I think that challenge of how to generate evidence in an in a emergency situation, how to get scientists to work together. And I think in India also, we saw many good examples, the INSACOG network um, and, and many new things that were put in place. Uh, but of course, when you collect a lot of data, you also should know how to use that data, how to analyze it, how to uh, put it out there, uh, both, uh, yes, as scientific publications, but also the public should be informed and updated uh, constantly about, uh, especially in a, in a rapidly changing field. So then we, we had these uh, vaccines that uh, started the results of the trials. The first few, of course, were the mRNA vaccines from Pfizer and Moderna. The results came within a few days of each other in November of 2020. And there was euphoria that they were just so effective. Uh, our target product profile had talked about a minimum efficacy of 50% because we were going with influenza experience where you the, most vaccines have a efficacy 50, 60%, 40 to 60, that range. So we said even a 50% efficacy vaccine for this is, it will be acceptable and good. But then we got these mRNA vaccines with over 90% efficacy and apparently very high safety as well. And so then the the process of making the guidelines on the vaccines, ensuring, looking at all of the data, ensuring, especially on the safety side, being very comfortable with the safety requirements. Of course, we knew that safety data was limited to a few months. We can't have four years of 
safety follow-up in a, in a pandemic. But then that means you need to have a pharmacovigilance system that is constantly uh, reporting on any severe side effects that you might want to take into account. Because sometimes when you use a vaccine in millions of people, of course, then the rare side effects do show up and you have to be uh, quite cognizant of that. So along with all this, of course, was happening was also the politics, which was uh, difficult. Um, but more than that was the misinformation that we saw had started uh, even from the first year onwards, different topics, but the disinformation and misinformation campaign, the misinformation is easier to handle than the disinformation, because that actually twists, takes a little bit of a scientific truth or a small kernel of a fact, but then twist in a way that is the interpretation is completely different and uh, you know, turn the whole thing around to mean something very different from what the original science would have shown. And that happened a lot for vaccines. It also happened for, for other things. So I think going for, for, forward, I think a challenge for science today is actually going to be to deal with misinformation and disinformation. Because whether you're talking the moment you say genetically modified, then you know people start imagining the worst. Um, or even if you're talking about gene editing, well, people don't know the difference, right? Um, when we even talk about a non-genetic uh, pro procedure like the Wolbachia infection in mosquitoes, which also makes them resistant to uh, dengue infection, uh, it's nothing genetic about it. You're injecting uh, this uh, bacteria, which is already in, found in nature, Wolbachia, it already infects insects, uh, but you're, in, in, you're doing it in the lab and then releasing them into the wild. These are the kind of situations where you'll get tremendous pushback and organized groups, you know, making uh, a lot of, uh, well, false. Uh, but then I realized that it's partly our fault also, because we can't keep blaming somebody else we also need to communicate. And as scientists or as medical professionals, we're not terribly good at that, right? We do our work, we publish, we're happy talking to our peers and people who understand our language. But how many times do we make it? I know that this campus is an exception and that you have a big program on uh, reaching out uh, you know, to society, but in general, uh, most scientific institutions don't. And even within the WHO, we saw that our communications had to go up you know, to a very different level from what it had been in the past, where we would, you know, people would issue a press conference notice, uh, I mean, a press note, if there was some new finding or some new guideline that's being released. And uh, maybe some technical officer would do a, a, a webinar, you know, but nothing at uh, the level at which we were engaging with the public through our press conferences, through social media, through interacting with mainstream media, and uh, of course, I found that there was a lot of positives to that, but also, of course, you get trolled, you get abused, you get, especially on social media. So being the first pandemic in a social media age, we, this was all very new, <laughs> but the next one is going to be in a social media age. So social media is here to stay. And so we have to learn how to manage uh, social media uh, as well. Um, and I think that whole thing was actually termed an infodemic by the DG of WHO very early in February, 2020. He said, not only are we fighting a viral pandemic, but we are fighting an infodemic. This was just two months into the pandemic where there was so much of information. Some of it is credible, but a lot of it is not. So for people, how do people distinguish between credible sources of information and, and something which is not? And it's, I met a, a, a woman from a West African French speaking country who told me that in her country, the vaccine uptake was 3%. And I said, why? And she said, well, people get their information from WhatsApp because they don't have trust in the government. They don't have trust in the authorities, including the public health authorities. And, and now there've been a few studies looking at the correlation between interpersonal trust uh, and the outcomes of SARS-CoV-2 in terms of mortality or in terms of vaccine uptake. And uh, what was found is that countries of uh, the Nordic countries, Scandinavian countries, uh, and some countries in East Asia, which have very high levels of 
trust between people, but also trust between the people and government showed the lowest death rates because they followed what government was telling them to do. And uh, probably uh, also a positive correlation with vaccine uptake. So I think for any public health intervention, and I think that's one of the lessons for public health is that is if there's an intervention where you need also the people to cooperate, or if there's behavior change involved, or any large scale, you know, even if you take polio vaccination, and what was needed for us to succeed was essentially the involvement of religious leaders, of local community leaders, of people whom the communities trusted. And that is how those last remaining communities who were holding out against polio vaccine actually got convinced and got their children vaccinated. And even today we have pockets where, small pockets, where parents refuse to vaccinate their children. Luckily in India, it's very small, but in the US and other high income countries in France, it's huge. 40% of people in France, when they were polled, said they did not uh, believe in vaccination. Uh, so again, the, the surveys that have been done showed India had one of the highest levels of trust in vaccines. So I think this issue of trust is again underestimated. You can't build it overnight. Obviously, it's something that happens over a period of time and public health authorities need to build trust. And one of the ways that happens is through community um, involving the community, community health workers. You know, we have ASHAs, we have Anganwadi workers, we have a lot of uh, people in the health system from the community. And you, when you go to the villages with them, you know that they are, most of them are respected, they are listened to, they are liked. And many ASHAs were actually uh, put themselves at risk during the vaccine campaigns when they went to very hostile uh, groups to convince them about vaccination. But because they're from the community, they're much more likely to be uh, listen to. So for public health programs, I think that uh, certainly is a challenge. Um, and when, for example, if you wanted to do release of mosquitoes, new, uh, you know, which are going to reduce the incidence of, let's say, dengue, some, you know, modified mosquitoes, there is no way you can do that without years of preparation with the community uh, or communities and Media is another very important, journalists are important stakeholder. I remember when we first did the HIV vaccine trial, uh, there was only one HIV phase one trial done in India. Uh, and it was, it was a safe vaccine, but didn't have any efficacy. But anyway, the phase one trial is just a safety study you do in healthy adult volunteers. Months of preparation and partnership with NGOs, civil society groups, journalists, media, you know, because there was so much of fear and stigma about HIV at that time that a vaccine trial was eliciting huge amount of interest um, from everyone, you know, and of course there were all these false things that you'll get, you do become positive, of course, zero positive, but that doesn't mean you're HIV positive, right? So for the layman, how do they distinguish if you say that you'll be zero positive and somebody tells, well, actually you're HIV positive. So this is where the scientists need to communicate. Um, and it's, it's challenging. You have to use language that people can understand. But I think it's a, an area that needs much more uh, interdisciplinary work. You need social and behavioral scientists uh, working along with scientists to communicate, uh, communicate these concepts. Um, I don't know what the time is. Uh, Okay, so I should probably stop because it might be better to have a discussion and a Q&A rather than, uh, yeah, so I think I've said, I've said enough, so I'll stop and I don't know if somebody's going to moderate the, yeah, I can see some hands going up. Thank you so much uh, for, uh, for the for the learnings that you had and your observations and your sharing your experience. So I, I was curious to know that you started your talk by saying uh, that uh, WHO, because it is a body, like a member state uh, group sort of institution, it's difficult to get a lot of things done in terms of on ground, right? You can give advisories and you can give things. So did the pandemic actually bring in any changes in the work like how the WHO should be working and in terms of uh, 
enforcing some uh, regulations and in that context? Yeah, that's a really good question because obviously there have been many committees now that have looked at how the world did respond to the pandemic, how did, what was WHO's response and of course, how did countries do? And the conclusion is, well, the global rules today are not uh, what we need. They, they were not fit for purpose, including the international health regulations that had been modified after the SARS outbreak. So even that was not enough to serve the purpose. And uh, there's, a, there's a terminology called the public health emergency of international concern, which uh, the WHO announces if advised by an expert group. So it's either that or it isn't. So there wasn't a system of upgrading your, uh, for example, early on, if there had been a traffic light system, even before there were cases outside China, one could have said to countries, alert yourself, you know, whereas you had to wait till you met that definition of a public health emergency, which was on the 30th of January of uh, 2020. Many people could have criticized saying it was too late. Um, so to answer your question, what's happening now is that these review committees have come up with like, I don't know, hundreds of recommendations again. But the crux of the matter is that countries have to agree. And these rules can only be changed if all the um, 100 and what are we, 192 member states agree, you know? And uh, there are lots of vested interests in everything. And these negotiations can take years sometimes. Like, like the framework convention on tobacco control took something like five, six, seven years. Similarly, the, the pandemic influenza framework, that took another four or five years. So here countries said, no, no, we can't take that long. We'll do it in two years. So May 24 is a deadline. So there are parallel sets of activities going on. There's the most important one is what's called the intergovernmental negotiating body that's now been meeting for the last year and plus, looking at uh, a framework for pandemics. What, how should countries behave during a pandemic? And what are the rules around trade? You know, everybody shut their borders, supply chains were disrupted, raw materials were not moving, personal pr pr protective equipment, only countries which were manufacturing had all other countries are waiting, you know, without these essential commodities. The World Trade Organization did nothing. So again, that's member state driven. So they also delayed and delayed till, you know, it was too late. So this is why this uh, pandemic, it's being called a pandemic accord or a pandemic treaty that's being negotiated, will hopefully lay down all the rules around how countries should behave. And, and what we said is that equity has to be at the heart of it because equity is what paid the price this time. We saw that the most vulnerable countries got left behind in everything, in everything. And so that can't happen the next time around. As you know, there are lots of powerful lobbies, the big pharma lobby, et cetera, mostly sitting in high-income countries, and therefore how much? So one of the early requests we made is share the technology quickly. Moderna, Pfizer, share your technology, let's ramp up, you know? And uh, they said, no, we'll make as many doses as you want. There's no need to share technology. So this is why we then set up the mRNA tech transfer program, saying we'll do it from scratch ourselves. We don't need big pharma. And so the hub in South Africa is now recreated an mRNA vaccine, which will now be, of course, it's too late for COVID, but it was proof of principle that in low and middle income countries, you can make these products without big pharma. But again, during a pandemic, speed is important. And who gets there first uh, could be anywhere in the world. And so there should be an, a commitment at least next time around to share that. And of course, now Africa has woken up and they've re realized that they have no manufacturing capacity. They're very limited R&D capacity. So they are building that it will take time, but there's a lot of political commitment in Africa now to build that. So hopefully there'll be some manufacturing, but again, without a willingness to share and putting profits over, over lives, then things won't change. But you know, that's been the history. It's not the first time that we've seen it happen in the world. Can't they be forced? Who's going to force them? The what about yeah, that governing thing will be the pandemic treaty. So if countries sign up for the treaty, then they are duty bound to force their own companies to share the data. But right now there are no rules like that. It was just goodwill 
and you expected some decent behavior to happen, which did not happen. So, uh, great talk, ma'am. So, uh, you mentioned correctly that you know AMR is an upcoming problem post pandemic. So, where do you foresee? You know, how are we heading towards AMR preparedness for this upcoming pandemic? And where is the diagnostics leading us? Because uh, may, most of the clinicians still rely on the age-old culture methods. What do you think about this? Yeah, so I think that's a great uh, question again. AMR is a very underappreciated problem and it's very complex also because you have things happening in different sectors which need to be regulated. The animal sector, the veterinary sector, of course, the human, how we prescribe, how we use antibiotics, what are the regulations around selling of antibiotics, whether hospitals are monitoring and reporting on data. From what we've seen, the trends, it's going up, up, up. And so it's very scary that uh, it's happening. So on the one hand, yes, we need R&D for new drugs, but the R&D for new drugs is, is also complicated because if you have a new antibiotic, you'll want to keep it and save it for the worst situation, right? And so that company is not going to make money because that antibiotic is not going to be widely. So there's no incentive. In fact, many companies are folded up because they've created a new molecule and then realize that there's nothing for them. There are no profits. So this is why you need government intervention. So wherever there is a public good needed where the private sector does not have an incentive, I think a TB vaccine is another good example. TB vaccine, I think companies can still make money, but maybe not huge profits. But these are, uh, there could be several examples where there needs to be public investment. And then there needs to be simultaneously, which did not happen during the pandemic. It's estimated $100 billion were invested in COVID vaccines alone. No government made the company sign on the dotted line saying, we're giving you this X billion dollars, which means you have to now supply the vaccine to us at our, on our terms, you know, um, at low cost, et cetera. Nobody except the AstraZeneca and the Serum Institute were the only ones, you know, the AstraZeneca, uh, because it came from Oxford, that vaccine, they had made that, that you can't sell it over $3. But um, so those are the kind of things which can happen in the future. More government investment, but with clauses uh, which are more public health uh, uh, oriented, yeah. Uh, hi, Somi. This, you know, very interesting uh, talk. But I w actually wanted to put you on the spot a little bit. Um, I mean, Chief uh, Scientific Officer at WHO, and you know, there were so many issues around, say, the origin of the virus. Yes. Right. Uh, I'm, I'm just wondering, from your perspective, how how is that? How did that play out? I, I have three three questions <laughs> which I'll ask. Second was about the death rates, yes. you know, from of the virus. I mean, and how did that play out? And the third was, of course, on on vaccine access, uh, access to vaccines. Yeah. So I, I just wanted to get you know get from you what what were you uh, dealing with when you were addressing these uh, these three. I, I think very crucial issues mm. around the pandemic. Um. So frankly speaking on the origins, I was not involved. There was a whole team that was uh, there mainly from the emergencies program. And uh, as you know, it was very tough. The committee went and then they're not able to really have access to all the data, et cetera. Even today, we don't have access to all the data. So. The two hypotheses still on the table are that it was a zoonotic infection, but it probably happened either in that wet market or some other wet market. Uh, or there were multiple jumps, I think, is, is what is believed now. But what was that intermediate animal? We don't, we don't know. Um, and when exactly it started and you know, going back to 2019, December back. All that, you know, if you had sample access to samples and so on, you could do. Hasn't happened. So obviously there's no confirmation of that. And the other is, of course, the lab leak hypothesis that that lab worked on coronaviruses. In fact, there are two labs in Wuhan that work on coronaviruses. And maybe there was this uh, strain, but again, it would have come from somewhere. It would have come from a bat or whatever. Uh, nobody believes that it was a lab engineered virus. I think there's absolutely no one today who has any, uh, nobody credible anyway, who believes that. So, but the lab uh, uh, accidental leak, well, that, that hasn't been ruled out. So I think these things continue to stay on the table. The problem is the more time that passes, the less likely we are to get to the truth. Uh, 
very unfortunate. There's a whole committee that was set up in SAGO, how to, in WHO called SAGO, on how to investigate the origin of uh, pandemics. But again, it requires cooperation. So probably that's one of the things that will go into the pandemic treaty is whichever country this new thing comes from must allow an international group of scientists. And we said from the beginning, WHO was saying this is scientific, if not political. Of course, it was politics was happening, which made it worse. But the people who went were all scientists and you know, they had relationships with Chinese scientists. But uh, it was the politics that spoiled the whole thing, I think, at that time. A second question was on uh, uh, the death. So the issue, of course, uh, which became very clear during COVID, but we've known for a long time, is that death reporting in most countries, in most low and middle income countries is very poor, very weak systems exist. And again, I was really impressed with South Africa and how they've, they had real time data on dashboards, you know, showing how many people had died and how much was the excess mortality due to each, uh, each time COVID went up. So there the question is, how do you strengthen your vital registration systems? The uh, um, birth and death registration and not only just death registration, but cause of death registration as well. And India should be doing much better than, than we are. Um, many states don't even report all deaths, uh, but even those that have high death reporting don't have a good cause of death. Uh, so this needs training uh, for doctors, but also because a country like India and, and large parts of Africa, deaths happen at home. Uh, it's not enough for doctors and hospitals to be certifying causes of death. You need a system by which when a death happens at home, you can have a simple way of, of certifying a probable cause of death. And this is now possible, you know, using your smartphone. Um, in Africa, the same thing, in fact, even worse, because there was no data at all. And people said Africa has been spared. Uh, they're not infected or they're infected, but they're very young. The median age is only 18 in Africa. And therefore, you never saw the impact of the pandemic and people didn't die. But there were studies in Zambia that looked at postmortem nasal swabs of people who just died in the hospital of whatever reason. And about, uh, you know, 60, 70% of them were COVID positive during that uh, a big wave that happened. So it is very difficult to, uh, to really estimate the true burden of the disease in any country. And that's why when WHO says there have been at least 7 million deaths, they always keep underlying, underlining 7 million. Now the other, under, at least the word at least, uh, the other confusion that happened was the, was the term excess mortality. Um, now, when WHO published a report talking about excess mortality, and uh, in fact, had some numbers for India as well, which were much, much higher than the COVID deaths that had been reported, it really talking about the deaths due to all causes that happened compared to deaths in the past. So pre-2019, if you take five years, you have an average of how many deaths happen in a year. And then you take 2020, 21, 22, and you see how many deaths are happening. And you'll see the difference is the excess mortality. So I think if you looked at that, it was very reasonable. Uh, and their model and everything was open to uh, people to see. Um, but I think it was not understood. And everybody thought that uh, it's COVID deaths that are being inflated to be so high. It wasn't actually. It was people dying of heart attacks, other things there, because they didn't have access to, to care during the pandemic. Um, so, so I think there's a lot of work uh, to be done uh, on improving our basic uh, systems. On vaccine access, um, yeah, I think the, the thing that made the difference was, did you have access to manufacturing or not? And if you didn't have access to manufacturing, if you're a very high income country, you can bid at a very high price, which is what many countries did to reserve uh, and, and high income countries had reserved vaccines across six or seven manufacturers because you didn't know which ones would have the successful vaccine. In COVAX, we didn't have the funds to do that. <coughs> and so you had to keep hedging your bets on which ones you think. And also we believe that in the beginning that mRNA vaccines would be very hard to administer because of the requirements for the minus 70 uh, storage and all that. And therefore a lot of the um, COVAX, uh, hopes were on the AstraZeneca vaccine, which was thought would be much more user-friendly and, and also affordable. And 
Serum Institute of India was the major supplier. Of course, they are the major supplier for many, many vaccines to Gavi. And so people were very confident. But then the Delta wave hit India. And uh, so India couldn't send any vaccines out. And therefore, the in inflow into COVAX completely dried up. So Pfizer and Moderna were busy supplying the high-income countries. AstraZeneca was well, Serum Institute was out, the other manufacturers didn't have that kind of volume. So for a large part of 2021, there was no vaccine, very little that went out into African countries, for example, or into Latin America. Some Latin American countries like Brazil were making their own, but, uh, and China was sending their vaccines uh, out. So I think the lesson that uh, was learned is firstly that uh, any centralized facility like COVAX, which is trying to be a vaccine supplier for the world would need access to funding, high levels of funding very quickly. So on day one, you would need those billions of dollars to block vaccine doses. And of course also invest. So we have CEPI working along with uh, Gavi and WHO. So CEPI was investing on the R&D side um, and some of their investments were paying off, but it was Gavi that had to make those bulk procurements. And the second thing is that if you don't have manufacturing, then you are at the mercy of, uh, of imports or donations. And third is that, of course, today, the, that the new vaccine platforms allow you, mRNA in particular, to be very modular. And you can set up small facilities, moderate size or very large size. And you can also multiply, uh, um, purpose it to do other things, um, which is why the sharing of that technology was, was important. The first mRNA vaccine for TB has just gone into phase one, I understand. Okay, I'll try to keep my answers short. Yeah, um, thanks uh, for the interesting talk. Uh, I have a question on the, like you said, the WHO is member state driven and it functions on treaties and agreements. So how big, uh, how, what is the impact of the North-South divide on the functioning of WHO? During the pandemic or in general? During the pandemic and in general. See, the WHO secretariat consists of uh, scientists and public health people and, and doctors. So the secretariat doesn't get affected by politics, right? So if you're doing guidelines on a particular topic, you'll convene a guideline development group, they'll do a systematic review, your guidelines will be based on evidence, etc. So where the politics comes in, and it's not always high income versus low income, it could be, but sometimes there are other groupings which play out. So last year, there was a resolution on uh, HIV, hepatitis and sexually transmitted infections, where there were objections to use of words like sexual and reproductive health and rights. Okay, so many countries wanted that phrasing uh, sexual health, sexual rights to be removed because they said this is uh, against their and there it's an odd combination of countries. It wasn't high income versus low income. Uh, some very conservative right wing countries you know, some religious things like that. So those things happen uh, once in a while. The other thing which happens of course is yes, sometimes countries have uh, some interest of their own which they come with. Uh, it could be related to trade or it could be related to something else which affects them. And uh, so they would come in and want uh, to have a say in something. But so we make a, dis uh, we have to distinguish between the scientific work, which has to be absolutely transparent. It has to be data driven. It has to be evidence-based. We can't compromise on that. So we never allow any compromise, even if countries come and complain and they get angry and all that as a process. But then there are things which go to the assembly, which is where they start haggling over these terms, like you can use this word, you can't use that word. So there's a lot of uh, editing that happens. And then things like the pandemic treaty, which is something new, which is being negotiated. Those, these are all negotiated things there. Each member state will have. And yes, there there is a North-South divide now because Africa felt extremely badly treated and marginalized during the pandemic in all ways. And so they, and countries like India, of course, support the global south. So you'll have a grouping of countries, like there were 100 countries that went to WTO to ask for a waiver on the, uh, uh, on the intellectual uh, property 
rights uh, of vaccines and drugs during uh, for the pandemic. Because India and South Africa that started it, but over 100 countries actually joined them. These were all low income countries. So yes, there is those kind of groupings which tend to form. So it all depends on the subject, the topic. Yes, Amya. Thanks for this very nice uh, overview. Touched upon so many different topics. Um, my question is specifically on the Delta wave, which uh, you know, when it hit India, we were already quite deep into the pandemic. There was a substantial level of uh, awareness and a lot of processes were in place and the COVID fatigue had not yet set in. Um, you mentioned examples from South Korea and Thailand and, and other places. So I'm trying to think, can, can we ever have a situation where we could think of something like an optimal level of preparedness for, for something like, like this? <laughs> Yeah, it's very difficult uh, to be prepared for the pandemic, I think is, is hard, but um, I think we have to keep practicing. And the way to do that, I think is to, is to build our systems to deal with the, the threats we have, you know, the present threats. So for example, TB is a pandemic, you know, HIV is a pandemic. Why can't we use some of the learnings from COVID to deal with the challenges we're facing today, the infectious disease and other challenges. We've got huge increase in digital, the use of digital technology, you know, telemedicine, telehealth, really. And India was in a good position because we already had the digital infrastructure. And so they were able to scale that up and it, it is continuing to be used, but I hope it will be used much more for delivering health. Um, so similarly, these networks of scientists that perform, whether it was for genome sequencing, or whether it was the private public partnerships for vaccine development, you know, this COVID Suraksha program. Uh, so many vaccine companies for the first time in India developed uh, a candidate on their own. Some of them, of course, also were licensing vaccines from abroad, but many of them went into, you know, development. We had a first DNA vaccine, we have an RNA vaccine. So why can't we have a challenge now where we bring everyone together and say, let's work on a TB vaccine. I think this is the only way to be prepared for the next, if we shut everything down now and say we'll, we'll put the switch on again, when the pandemic comes, we'll again be caught sleeping. So I think on the scientific side, it's very clear what we should do. And I think the blueprint I mentioned, we need an R&D blueprint for India. What are those public health products that we don't have today that we need? You know, What are the rapid diagnostics we need? Uh, diagnostics are just not used or available in the public health system, right? It's all guesswork. And this is why we use so many antibiotics, etc. So I think that's one on the on the public health side. Again, it's very clear what we need. We need a public health cadre in every state. There's only two or three states which have a public health cadre in India. It's it's there in the national health policy of 2017 that every state must establish public health cadre. You need these multidisciplinary trained teams. You need epidemiologists, you need entomologists, public health entomologists, you need data managers, you need statisticians, you need, uh, you know, probably a social scientist, you need a bunch, and then you need the interaction with the community, etc. So, and a public health cadre is going to not just wait for a pandemic, they're going to deliver a lot of public health services. So I can't understand why we're not really moving faster in that uh, in that direction, it's so clear now. And then you need the health system, which is resilient. Oxygen was one example, of course, which many countries actually face that terrible situation of lack of oxygen. So hopefully that will be rectified, but there are other such gaps uh, which need to be identified. So a, a learning exercise of uh, what did we do well? What, where did we have the challenges and gaps? What do we need to fill? Human resources for health. You know, there were a lot of contract staff that have all been disbanded, you know? Uh, so I think health is something where we can create a lot of employment opportunities by bringing in skilled people, because it's not only doctors and nurses, huh? you need a lot of allied health uh, professionals today to really provide uh, what we would call a comprehensive primary health care. So I think vision has to be much because I think we're make, going in the right direction. You know, the Ayushman Bharat program has put a lot of investments in infrastructure. And uh, you see the primary health care centers and the health and wellness centers are 
definitely much, much better than they were before. And there's an awareness on health. Um, but I think there needs to be really a strategic thinking on where the gaps were and how to fill those. But also on the science side, how do we, how do we connect? And what we saw was a collaboration that happened during the pandemic, which doesn't normally happen. You know, people put aside their individual uh, egos or whatever it is and came together to, to share and to work on a common mission and a goal. So once you create a common mission and a goal, then it becomes easy to pe for people to join into that. So a quick, uh, in fact, I had a similar question on the public health. Uh, the, in the vaccine uh, trial strategy, the, because it was a pandemic time, the trial was done, it was also easier to do it at scale. Yeah. A huge uh, you know, number of people were continuously getting infected, so easy to yes. find out what is the impact of yeah. you know, vaccine post, sorry, infection post vaccination. So, but at the same time, after vaccination, this Omicron wave, almost whole world mm. was infected, reinfected right. again. So now it is difficult to find out yes. what's the long term effect of vaccination itself, which normally earlier vaccination, mm. vaccine trials used to wait for four or five years and all. So what would be the thinking for the future vaccine trials? Because there's a big advantage mm. to do vaccine trials in places where there is actually infection spreading. Yes. So I think the kind of vaccines that you would want to test in the future are like um, transmission blocking vaccines or those that reduce infection. Because we know the current vaccines are not preventing us from getting infected. They're only preventing us from getting sick. Um, and, and they're offering very little protection against infection. But for example, the, the Bharat vaccine which is a nasal vaccine, um, perhaps has uh, that additional potential of uh, also protecting against infection. We don't know. So actually that can be studied regardless of what the underlying immune status of the population is. Like we could have studied it in this previous wave because all you need to do is to vaccinate people and see whether yeah, you can reduce infection. Once they're infected, okay, they they already have that underlying protection from their other vaccines, but infection I think we can still test in this population. The second thing we can do is to follow cohorts of people who've been vaccinated with two doses or three doses for a long, and we need to do that because how we don't know whether next year you're going to need a booster or not, or the year after that, and how COVID is going to behave and how quickly our immunity will wane. Till now, we seem to be okay. Okay, so two years after a vaccine, we all seem to be still having, even if we get infected, we don't get sick. There are people in the hospital and there are still people dying. So that will be there. But what I'm trying to say is that the long-term effectiveness of a vaccine can be studied through cohort uh, studies, which can be followed clinically. And then of course, you can also test antibodies and uh, things like that over a period of time. But I think that's important because our future policy on COVID vaccination is going to depend on whether our population still remains protected or not. So, and then the, the search for the pan coronavirus vaccine. So I think any new vaccine which is coming will have to have major advantages over the existing ones. Otherwise, no point doing clinical trials. So either they should block infection, which will be fantastic, or they should protect against a much broader range of coronaviruses. We would like to close out on the questions because of time constraints. Thank you so much, Dr. Swaminathan, for that thought-provoking talk and for your time. Uh, we have tea outside, and we'll be a couple of minutes to interact with uh, Dr. Swaminathan before she leaves to the airport. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, I'll have some more. I'm sure that you can stack for the question answering.